They represent a new form of social rebellion. Hippies are very interesting to the young. They dress in bizarre and colorful ways. They wear their hair long. Their very name suggests that they are hip, on to something good. Most of them are young, although some are old enough to have children of their own. There are colonies of hippies springing up in most American cities. They all declare themselves rebels against our society, but they want to withdraw from it instead of trying to change it. It is hard to figure out what positive things they are in favor of. They like music. The word love is used by them a lot. Their diversions might seem to be harmless enough were it not for one thing. In a very aggressive and evangelical way, they praise the effect on the mind of hallucinatory drugs, particularly the drug LSD. The drug is what holds their subculture together, and the drug is extremely dangerous. It is the temptation and the danger that we propose to examine. CBS News, without any flowers in its hair, is in San Francisco because this city has gained the reputation of being the hippie capital of the world. I'm Harry Reasoner. We're asking whether any central idea unites the hippie colonies in this and other cities, whether they have anything to tell us, why there is so much emphasis on the use of the drug LSD in their philosophy. Those are our questions. We'll try now for the answers. It is a tradition in American life to respect young people. We are glad when they have ideas, and we are proud of a nation which has taken its strength from the new, from experiment, dissent, and change. But now, at a time when we are suffering some of the worst agonies of our history, both at home and abroad, when we are most in need of new energies and new solutions, more and more young people appear to be turning away from challenge into dreamy narcosis. The hippies present a strange problem. Our society has produced them. There they are in rapidly increasing numbers. And yet there seem to be very few definite ideas behind the superficial glitter of their dress and behavior. They're in favor of taking things easy, that much you can see at first glance. They like to seek out simple and inexpensive pleasures. Their main colony has grown up in a low rent district of San Francisco, which is called Haight-Ashbury, from the intersection of two streets there. The place has become a mecca for young people from all over the nation who come in search of something new and significant for themselves. It is a mecca, too, for tourists who come to look at the hippies. So what was a quiet residential and shopping center has become a milling turmoil of seekers. Many of them are seeking a new sensation, and that is the drug lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD, or acid for short possession of which has been declared illegal in California, but which is easily accessible here. The hippies have declared the use of this and similar hallucinatory drugs to be the source of new and valuable ins The effect of LSD is to change the way the brain handles sensory input. The result is violent distortion of thought and feeling. The user may see a wild complexity of images, hear a multiplicity of sounds. This is called taking an acid trip. For every user, there is the danger of a bad trip on the drug, where sensory distortion becomes terrifying, and the acid head may leap from a window or run wildly through traffic. There is a steady flow into San Francisco hospitals of young people who have freaked out and been picked up by the police in a state of desperate terror. Where are you taking me? Where are my friends? Do my friends know I'm here? Where am I? Where are we? You're in the hospital here. Come on. Who are you? I'm Dr. The bad trip is a frightening thing to witness. It must be far more terrifying to experience. Where are you taking me? Where am I? Coming right around here to the desk. You're in the hospital. Who are you? Hello, I'm a nurse. What's your name? Your hands are cold. What's your name? Joan. Joan, I'm a nurse. Gus? I don't want to be here. Where am I? It's all right. It's all right. I'm it's all right. I'll get you back on. It's all right. I'm a nurse. It's all right, Joyce. 
Hi, John. My name is Gus. I'm going to take you to your room now. Hospital people, whether they want to or not, are becoming expert in the handling of LSD users in trouble. At the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute, Dr. J. Thomas Ungerleiter sums up the things being learned. Well, we're learning that it's a very dangerous drug, and it's a very unpredictable drug. We're learning that people can have a bad experience, which they call a freak trip or freak out or bummer, the first time they use the drug, or they can have it after 150 previous good experiences. We're learning that there's no way to screen out the adverse reactors, that not psychiatric interviews, not psychological testing, not a history of absence of symptoms or of job stability, nothing guarantees immunity from the bad trip. People come in often with frightening auditory and visual hallucinations. They hear and see things that are frightening. They come in with anxiety to the point of panic. They come in with depression, with suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts, some severe, and they come in with confusion. They wander about not knowing where they are. And the difficulty with it is we can't predict. Another thing that we're seeing are the flashback phenomena, the reoccurrences, up to 18 months now, after you take the drug once, you can have the acute symptoms return in their original intensity, either in a situation of stress or in no stress situation. And um, originally we were seeing a lot of youngsters who took uh, LSD as part of a chronic drug abuse problem. Now we're seeing youngsters who took it at a party or with the gang, got over the acute effects after the 12 to 16 hours, and then months, even years, a year, 18 months later, began to have the reoccurrent symptoms, the flashback phenomena. And this frightened them, and then they came for help, because they couldn't control when they were having it. The street, where hippies like to congregate, shows no hint of the horror behind the scenes in hospitals. But the street thrusts the hippies at the community. They can't be left to go their own way and forgotten, because they make their presence felt. For one thing, they take up a good deal of public space. They congregate, sit down, make music, make crowds. Come on, come on, let's go. Come on, boys. Let's go. Come on, break it up. Hey, you, you. Let's go. Come on. Thank you, officer. When the crowd gets big enough to block passage along the sidewalk or to draw complaints from merchants along the street, the police will move in and break it up. The hippies move off amiably with exaggerated politeness. And flow along the street is resumed for a while. In a sense, they have taken over the community by superimposing their own subculture and values upon it. They express contempt for money and pride themselves on being able to manage without it. But they are not above begging. Many of them earn bread by selling copies of various underground newspapers. This is the office of a San Francisco hippie newspaper called The Oracle. It's a busy place. Entering it, you can get a stronger impression of the hippies building a society of their own than can be had from the street scene outside. These people have a united purpose. They believe they have found a viable way of life which has its own values and vocabulary, which has its own psychedelic symbols. If young people are being induced to turn away from the straight world, they must have the feeling that there is something to turn to, something more than just idling about. There must be a destination as well as motives for going. What might these be? We asked Gabe Katz, one of the editors of the Oracle. We look around you, nothing works. The only thing we're the kid is presented with is when you grow up, look, you know, uh, you can join the army, you can go to war, you can get a gig uh, working as an engineer and become a vegetable and dr drive to work in your own car, your own big metal box. And, uh, you know, just, it looks absurd. You know, people in their metal boxes like this going all over from job to job, frustrated, uptight. Uh, what joy is there in life? Life should be, life is, sh is and should be ecstasy. Being alive should be a joy, and it's a drag for most people because they're, they never had a chance to figure it out for themselves what they wanted to do. You were a this, or you're going to be a this, I'm going to school to do this. When you go to school for the right to earn, to learn to earn, to buy more pieces of metal junk, and, you know, I think the kids that are here uh, that are getting into this whole thing now, this evolution now is one that... Uh, as a result of the uh, alienation that a child feels, particularly a middle-class American feels, 
of not really uh, relating to his family. Uh, father's somebody that goes to work, and he gets shoved in the school, and uh, is constantly subject to uh, one authority or another. And uh, when he turns on, he sees, wow, there's something else. Another name the hippies have adopted for themselves is the love generation. They like to feel an expanded, communal sort of love. They enjoy a sense of being part of a group, united by general affection for each other, a group where people serve and support each other. Every afternoon at four, hungry hippies begin to congregate in the Panhandle, an offshoot of Golden Gate Park. They are waiting for the arrival of the Diggers, a hippie subgroup who show up at this time with a station wagon full of food, which is given free to anyone who wants it. Diggers are not the undersold. The Diggers get this food in handouts from stores or restaurants or the wholesale markets. This feeding typifies the hippie ideal of standing apart from society by means of mutual help and love. It contains its own ironies for the daily feed-in is dependent for the food being offered on the very society that is being rejected. It's all done with a smile, but it grates against the straight world because it seems like saucy children playing. Isn't this a funny kind of love? We asked Dr. Duke Fisher of the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute. Well, that's a good question. I think the, the primary reason that you hear so much talk about love, like love sessions, love groups, love ends, is because many of the acid users have the most difficulty with love. And uh, many of them think that they can solve the problem with, by using LSD. Uh, if you'll notice, most of the people who use LSD, or the acid users, talk about loving humanity in general, an all-encompassing love of the world, but they have a great deal of difficulty loving one other person, or one specific thing. That will, in turn, make certain demands on them. Uh, so the kind of love they have uh, is a very uh, narcissistic kind of love. It's a sort of love for love's sake. But there's very little real love in terms of interpersonal relationships or one person loving another person for any length of time. I think the other reason is because love implies no anger and no hostility. And many LSD users are people who have a great deal of trouble tolerating getting angry or being hostile. They don't like to experience this kind of feeling. Uh, they're concerned about their ability to handle it. So they use LSD, hopefully to uh, suppress or deny uh, angry feelings. Uh, and they sort of take this very peaceful uh, approach. But unfortunately, it is a facade that can't last. And I think many times, uh, if you'll notice, uh, I saw well, one example was a young girl who kept offering a uh, flower to a policeman. And he said he didn't want to take it, and he was becoming increasingly annoyed. And she persisted in offering the flower to him. Now, I'm sure we'd have to say that really wasn't out of love. There was a provocative insistence that she was using. But I'm sure she would uh, dis disclaim any kind of feeling of aggression in terms of what she was doing with the flower. So I think if you, if you actually take a look at what's happening, you'll see that in the name of love, there's a great deal of hostility being expressed. But unfortunately, it's not being felt because many of the users of LSD uh, particularly need to use it to avoid letting themselves experience anger and hostility, which is very normal for all of us to experience. People who suppress or dilute normal feelings with drugs get a kind of euphoria which is easy to maintain for a while since it entails making fewer demands on life. The hippies see mystical virtues in this blandness. It makes them extremely self-righteous. Here, in a hippie pad, one member recalls giving a flower to an old lady. Let's say a woman's coming up the street with a small shopping bag, and I've got some flowers that mm. I picked someplace. I hand her a flower. It's maybe 11 o'clock in the afternoon. I say, isn't it a beautiful day? Isn't it a gassy day? And if he for a moment looks up and says, yeah, it really is a beautiful day, which happens to me quite often, they suddenly realize what a groovy day it is, what a pretty flower it is I've given them, all the color around them, all the life, all the beautiful things that are happening. Things that are happening is what we are trying to make people aware of. But the drug doesn't create anything. The drug, LSD, is not a creation. It is a catalyst. It works with your mind to create whatever your mind creates. What LSD does is it opens your awareness in the way that when you look at, say, a kerosene lamp, you have one thing that you associate with it. 
When you take LSD, not just one association, but every association you can possibly have is brought through your mind. I, I like to turn on, man. I love to be stoned on acid and to participate in that energy flow that's going on in the streets, in the parks, in the movie theaters. I love to listen to the radio and to listen to music and to go to dances. My little behavior doesn't stop when I take a drug. It's heightened. Uh, my sense of awareness, my, my whole sensory apparatus. And if I can still dig on music when I'm straight, the same way I do when I'm on acid, maybe that's it. Then I want to stay there, and I'm not going to turn on anymore. Most LSD users say they will stop taking the drug if it is proved it does definite harm. Proof of this appears to be emerging. Researchers are studying what LSD does to the chromosomes, that part of the human cell which determines life balance and hereditary characteristics. Dr. Jose E. Guthque, chairman of the Department of Genetics at the Oregon Regional Primate Research Center, has conducted experiments comparing blood samples taken from LSD users with samples taken from non-users. His tests have shown that there is a higher rate of chromosomal abnormality up to two and a half times more in LSD users. Well, chromosomes are found in all cells, and any character that you will pass on to your children is born by these chromosomes. Uh, the genes in the chromosomes will determine if your eyes are going to be blue, if your hair is going to be brown. Uh, they will direct protein enzyme synthesis, and any function that takes place in your body is finally directed by the genes in the chromosomes. Some of the abnormalities found in LSD users take the form of chromosomes being broken when they should be whole, or smaller than is normal, or the wrong shape entirely. The effect of this upon individuals who use LSD, or upon children born of them, remains to be determined. But Dr. A. Guthque firmly underlines the danger. Uh, we could say that uh, the chromosomes, or for the matter of the genes, are in the very core of life. Uh, playing with LSD is playing with the chromosomes. I think that this can have uh, disastrous consequences at the end. More and more doctors say these warnings should be heeded, that drug users should consider their descendants, if not themselves. <laughs> this is an unusual hospital treatment center, the Macaulay Neuropsychiatric Institute in St. Mary's Hospital. In this ward, they're responsible for the care of children up to the age of 18 with emotional and neurological problems. Not all of the problems are drug problems, but because of the geography, just a few blocks from the center of Haight-Ashbury, this institution has learned more than most about what happens when you take LSD. The doctors and the nurses here wear ordinary clothing as part of the attempt to produce a non-hospital atmosphere. But it is a closed ward. You don't get out without a key. Reporter Warren Wallace talks with one patient. Do you uh, like LSD? Yes. Why? Well, because for one, it, it teaches me a lot about myself that I didn't know. And it, it kind of informs me about my environment and what goes on. What does it tell you about yourself? It tells me what I like. What, what do you like? Well, <laughs> you know, I can't really explain what I like. It's hard to explain. You see, you've had an experience that I haven't had, and I'm trying to find out what your experience is like, what it does for you, what it feels like. Well, um, it makes everything a little unreal, you know? Everything that is it, it hallucinations project from my mind, and uh, everything that I see is, is myself. I mean, it's all coming from my mind, and, and all, the, all the things that I see, everything that I see is... Is all, I'm, all, I'm making it all. You're controlling everything? Yes. I'm controlling what the scenery looks like about me. I'm not controlling it necessarily, but when it's happening, that's, that's what's me. That's me happening. How about people? Do you think that uh, before you used the drug, you were afraid of people? Well, I didn't know it at the time, but I realized that I was when I took the drug. Because it brings out your inner feelings more intensely. And why do you think you were afraid of them before? Because I didn't know them. Do you feel that you do know them through the drug? 
No, I don't feel that I know them, but I'm not afraid of being rejected by them because I, I don't feel any rejection towards them. I, I used to be constantly thinking about being afraid of them, but now I, I don't have to be afraid anymore because they're all beautiful, and whether they reject me or not, they're still beautiful. Does it ever seem to you that this may be a little unreal? Oh, yes. But, I mean, uh, after, after you learn this on an acid trip, you practice it when you're straight, too. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't enough, leave you. If everybody is beautiful, then there's no one who's, say, dangerous to you. Oh, but the dangerous people are beautiful, too. They're dangerous, sure, but they're still beautiful. Why are you here? Well, it's a long story, but I'll try to break it down in short. I, I found God, and uh, I, I made me feel quite good, you know? And my mother mistook this good feeling for uh, taking drugs, and I was getting kind of wayward and everything. I mean, I wasn't coming home on time, so she phoned the police, and I was brought to YGC, and then I was brought here. Because of my talking about God and everything, they might have thought that I was a little crazy. Do you think you are? No. But I understand how they felt, because I wasn't making myself clear on it. It's very hard to... Ex I was trying to express something that was hard to express, and I wasn't really capable of expressing it. I mean, I can have the relationship between myself and God, but I, it's a mistake to try to make other people feel the way I did, and that's what I was trying to do. What's God like? Well, first of all, God is everything, so he is like everything. He is everything. There's nothing that, he's, that he isn't like. Is he like a man? I, I don't know. Everything, he lives in everything, everything on this earth. I can't describe to you the feeling that it gives you when your son says to you, can't you feel it? God is everywhere. Uh, I'm going with God. I'm waiting for God to come and get me. Uh, it, it's, it's a, it isn't a happy thing at all or an inside. It's a death wish. And I tried talking sense to him. I said, Jimmy, you don't see God till you die. But he, he couldn't see that at all. He believed that he was seeing him right now. Jim hasn't adjusted well to school. He's an extremely introverted boy, or has been up until lately, uh, shy. He wouldn't try. Yeah, the least sign of failure to him meant an automatic stop right now. And I, I think that the problems that he had were magnified and triggered by the release that he seemed to find in drugs. And I feel as though that this is, many of the, of the children today are doing this type of thing. And if, if it could be stressed that this is a medical problem and not a criminal problem, I believe that parents would be on the telephone calling somebody as soon as they found illegal material around the house, which they don't do now because they're afraid they're sending their sons and daughters to jail. Another patient under lock and key. What brought you to this place? Oh, I, I tried to commit suicide. Why did you do that? Oh, because there was just a lot of things on my mind and I really couldn't clear them out. Like what? Um, I don't, well, it could be from, you know, my taking narcotics before. What um, sort of narcotics were you taking? Well, um, LSD and meth uh, crystal. What's crystal? Well, it's, it's a, it, I, I really don't know what it really is, but I've taken it and it's like, it speeds you up, you know, and, and it just makes your mind run really fast. I've taken uh, acid and crystal at the same time, which wasn't very good, and I kind of freaked out on my trip. What happened when you freaked out? Well, um, the people I was with, they made me freak out. I mean, you know, they were just trying to blow my mind, you know, and this I couldn't control. But I got away from it and, you know, everything was okay afterwards. But I think it was the after effects that really kind of screwed me up, you know, messed me up a lot. You say that the people you were with were trying to blow your mind. What were they doing? Well, they were just saying things like, oh, um, 
you know, uh, we're going to rape you. I mean, just these things. And, and they just keep on saying it over and over in different uh, kinds of talking. And these people on us were animals. I mean, strictly animals. I mean, they were, oh, I mean, you know, just a bunch of beasts. They didn't care what they did to you, you know, what happened. And, I mean, it just really scared me. The girl's mother. What has happened to your daughter? Uh, she lost interest in herself. Um, she was very lethargic. She didn't, uh, she didn't want to do anything. She just, she didn't want to go to school. She didn't want to do anything at home. She didn't want to do the things that she used to do. I mean, she just, she stopped going around with um, people altogether. Uh, she just, she withdrew. And she, um, to me it was a big change because um, she lost a sparkle in her eye. And she really looked like she wasn't even amongst, you know, anybody that, that should be here. She was more or less a zombie. And uh, she didn't, um, it's, <clears throat> it's hard for me to explain. Um, I was there, you know, the whole time with her. I, I just saw her uh, change completely. And she was, she just wasn't the same girl she had been. She, um, she tried to take her life three times. And, um, She wasn't successful, of course, but um, she did. Um, she did try, and the fact that she did try, um, I don't know, bothered me that someone so young and you know vivacious and lovely, and someone with so much to really live for, would do this. What did she tell you? She told me that uh, while she was under the influence of um, LSD, she was forced to. Um, have sexual relationships, or a sexual relationship. And, um, you know, it's just, um, when I found this out, I, I, I just, you know, I, I didn't know what to say, and, and she asked me if I was angry, and I said, well, how can I be angry? I, it just, I didn't think that anything like this would ever happen. I wanted something different for her. Uh, I wanted her to finish school, and I would have liked for her to, if she wanted to, go on to college and be something that, well, a little out of the ordinary, because I feel that she has the potential. And I've always felt this way, that she did have more than average potential. What does she feel? Right now, I, I don't think she feels anything. Um. Why do these things happen? We asked the director of the Macaulay Neuropsychiatric Institute, Dr. Michael Klentzos. This is really a very serious, malignant form of modern civilization, which means that we no longer have the stamina to really hassle with our youngsters in a purposeful way of learning, that we are too big in our own way to develop our own self-centered worlds of achievement, the adult world, so the youngsters in their own way have to discover a shortcut to growing up. We have not experienced in this profound change where you can get a, forget about religion, home, everything else is meaningful except the fact that you've discovered something that is your own and this is how you must discover life. You must find this out for yourself. Mom, you don't understand. You go out and do what I do and you'll begin to see the difference. For many, the price of taking the shortcut to discovery the hippies put forward turns out to be very high. With an electroencephalograph, doctors fasten tiny electrodes to the head of a patient by means of which they are able to measure the cyclic rhythms of brain activity. And, uh, and uh, this is a, one of the two types of changes that we see in these uh, individuals that take uh, over 20 trips for this LSD. With heavy LSD users, patterns of brain activity which should be slight and quick are slow and heavy. Where there should be variety, there are uniform paroxysmal bursts. These are the sort of patterns which are found in victims of brain disorders, like epilepsy. Another warning, another mark of the self-destructive quality of drug abuse. In spite of the risks, in spite of reported freakouts and other disasters happening to individual hippies, the package they offer continues to be extremely attractive to the young. 
Here, the diggers have rented a whole house and declared it open to all, with food available 24 hours a day. By the house rules, no one is supposed to bring in acid, but the drug is talked about and joked about as being on the scene. Get that out of here. This underlines a problem which makes it hard to take a tolerant view of the hippies. The way they dress, the way they advocate love as opposed to hate, peace as opposed to war, self-expression as opposed to inhibition. All these things put them in the role of courageous and warm-hearted rebels against cold, stiff, square, old-fashioned authority. The trouble is that a group where anything goes does not seem to provide good company for the very young. Doctors see a universal danger in use of LSD. They feel that normally rebellious young people may be turned into emotional cripples at a time when they should be meeting and solving problems of sexuality and personal identity. They deaden their drives with a magic pill which solves nothing. They may never grow up. This pad has been closed since we filmed it and the diggers complain that others are raided and that they are harassed by the police and misjudged by their elders. My mom thinks that where I'm living down here, the hippies are a bunch of filthy and infectious people. This is my bag, and I, I found my place here when I came to this house here and started cooking. I, I got my own room, and I do my cooking, and I scream and I holler, and I'm happy. We found a cattle come in like a hippie, and he's a cop, and he'll make a stash so that the other cops can come in and bust the pad. Why would they and want to do that? They don't like because us. Because they don't like us. Why don't because we like they're, they're because, we, have, because we're, we are doing things. They're trying to break up the people. See, they don't like these houses, and they're trying to bust it up. You see, we're, we're out to change laws to make new society. The aggressive determination of hippies to start a new society has made its mark upon San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury. Part of the neighborhood is occupied by ordinary people, bewildered by what's going on. Part of it is occupied by a growing population of hippies. There are a lot of for sale signs in Haight-Ashbury. There are a lot more houses being occupied by hippies. The hippies are capable of extremely hard work, even though they tend to approach work as the rest of us do sport. Some of them are very successful. This is the house of a popular local band which plays hard rock music. They call themselves the Grateful Dead. They live together comfortably in what could be called affluence. There are many other similar houses or apartments in Haight-Ashbury maintained by hippies who work in places where employers do not mind bizarre dress or long hair. Their concept of a new style of life unites them. And that concept is, in most cases, drawn from the drug experience. The Grateful Dead themselves acknowledge they have used LSD. Warren Wallace asked them what they thought the hippie movement was trying to accomplish. Uh, what, what we're thinking about is a peaceful planet. We're not thinking about anything else. We're not thinking about any kind of power. We're not thinking about any of those kind of struggles. We're not thinking about revolution or war or any of that. That's not what we want. Nobody wants to get hurt. Nobody wants to hurt anybody. We would all like to be able to live an uncluttered life, a simple life, a good life, you know, and like think about moving the whole human race ahead a step or a few steps. <clears throat> And, or a half uh, a step. Yeah, or a half a step, or anything. So or at least, least not more positive. At least attitude. not going around in circles like it is now. Do you think that your movement or your idea, the hip idea, is essentially connected up with drugs? Yeah, I would say that, that that's uh, a, a large part of the framework. I think that most of the people who are hippies now came to it through drugs. Yeah, but it's not a dope movement. We're not trying to We're not spread pushing dope. dope. Yeah, well, we, I think, for personally, that uh, the more people turn on, the better world it's going to be. We were but, talking uh, before about a way of being, and yeah. and and one of the ways of, of achieving that being is through through uh, drugs, through expanding your uh, consciousness, consciousness, changing yourself. But like uh, most of us have given up uh, the psychedelic drugs anyway. Uh, yeah, right. Well, we've learned something from them, and now we're kind of playing around with that knowledge. And what have you learned? Well. It's, you can, you can point out the example that the people that live in the community and, uh, you know, play around with dope and stuff like that, they don't have wars, you know. 
and uh, they don't have a lot of problems that the, uh, the larger society has. Uh, in, in essence, in, the scene has grown up with us, and we have grown up with the scene. Uh, we've all grown up together, and uh, uh, we feel more like children than ever. All right. Uh, we're because we know what we're trying to do. We're trying to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> the tragedy is that growing up is a process that medical opinion regards as being inhibited by LSD. The acid rock bands of San Francisco play in large halls like this. The music and the light show which accompanies it carry the same howling and glittering intensity ascribed to the hallucinatory experience. Most of the faces you see are young. No liquor is served. Drugs are, of course, officially banned. But how can you ban a pill? Flickering strobe lights accentuate the sense of unreality, of having blown your mind. It may seem, all of it, highly exciting, a pleasurable trip into Wonderland, until one begins to wonder about destinations. It is on the street outside that some of the worst destinations are discovered. Night is the time when the street does not seem so colorful nor hospitable. It seems a place of danger. Night is the worst time for freakouts, for the terror of a bad trip on drugs. Night is the time when the sickness that comes from not eating enough, sleeping in the park, closes in to bring fear with it. A number of doctors who are concerned over the health of the young people who are flocking to hate Ashbury have started a free clinic where anyone can come to get medical attention. The doctors, supported by a staff of hippies, work for nothing. They want to learn and they want to help. There are a lot of hippies who need help. Well, what's, uh, what's your address, Doc? Huh? What's your address for the record? Uh, yes, what's my address? I don't know. No. No. Where do you live at? You might be narcotics. <laughs> Have you been here before, Dan? Yes, I'm almost here. been here all day. Yes, I'm almost 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 Okay, sit a while, and when we're ready for you, we'll give you a call. Okay, very okay? good, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, very good. Yeah. Is there any calls? Yeah. Is there any more? You're really grooving on your thing, then. I made the call. Uh, I almost freaked out. Yeah. 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 I'll make it again. Yes, that's why you stopped there. I said, let me just play for you. Ray, come on over here. Have a seat right up here. Yeah. How long have you been sick? Yeah. Yeah. About two weeks, really. What's been trouble? The sore throat? Yeah, it's all wrong. Yeah. Are you getting fever or chills? I have some chills. Yeah. Have you been sleeping inside? Yeah. Have you been eating all right? Yeah. I know. I still have some chills. Any, uh, any uh, sore ears or any trouble with your ears? No headache or anything? All right, listen. You slip your beads and your shirt off here. Let me take your tail. Yeah. LSD is the main drug used in the hippie world. But now other drugs are beginning to enter the scene, so that many times doctors or their helpers will not know what a patient has taken or how to begin treatment. I think he's tired, man. That's a bummer when you shoot. Haven't you ever been so tired you were just like that? The crystal. Oh, I the crystal. Like about that. Oh, the crystal. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, it's just what? a tumor. You shoot acid, man. I don't have anything to do. Yeah, it'll kill you a lot. 
Okay. I dropped a mess up one time, I almost died, and took me to the hospital. And I just cussed until I passed out. How long is he gonna be out? I don't know, it depends on how much he did up. If that's what he did, I don't know. What are we using as an ashtray? When they hauled me into the hospital, I must have slept for two days, and I still had 46 left in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Hey, baby, come on. Would you like to wake up? Thank you. Well, did the guy that wants to I know, it's Kurt. You want to wake up? I've done my duty. You're up. Are you up? Are you feeling all right? What? What happened? You went on a bummer? All right. I had to take care of some woman who was on a bummer. So oh, you took care of some woman, and that's why you're crashing now? Hey, man. Let me go back to sleep. Kurt, Kurt wants to try to sleep. Up hey, man. Hey. Let me look at your throat. Let me look at your throat. This throat's fine. There must be a special motive relating to a larger view of society to bring doctors already overworked to serve extra hours in this clinic. The clinic was created by the director of the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Screening Unit of San Francisco General Hospital, Dr. David Smith. And we asked him about this. Most of the people that volunteer for our clinic are either young people like myself, who have some special interest in the area, uh, or are older people that have teenage kids of their own. And we find that an individual's attitude towards uh, well, let them die. Uh, that's their bag. Changes dramatically when their own child goes to the Haight-Ashbury. And that many of our doctors, we've had a, a marvelous response from the medical community, and many of the doctors are older doctors that have teenage daughters, and they want to help, honestly want to help. But they also state that they want to learn more about what's making uh, the young people in the Haight-Ashbury run away from middle-class homes. The kids in the Haight-Ashbury are not poverty-stricken. They don't have poverty-stricken backgrounds. Many of them have gone to school, uh, uh, come from good homes, and for some reason they run away from home and go to the Haight-Ashbury. I think one thing that people don't realize is that the Haight-Ashbury is a symptom, not a cause, and that the kids are attracted to the Haight-Ashbury because of some deprivation, primarily intellectual deprivation, uh, in their former mode of life. And I think this is why the middle class is so intensely involved in the Haight-Ashbury, because it is a product of the middle class. It's not a peripheral movement. It is a direct reaction against the forces that control the United States. It's not an anarchist movement. The hippies aren't interested in, in uh, any philosophy, including communism. They just want to live their own life. Many people say that this is a communist-inspired movement. They're, not in a, they're reacting against any structured philosophy, uh, whether it be uh, uh, a university or communism or whatever. They just want to live the way they want to live without structural uh, bindings. The way the hippies want to live seems in the end to consist of childish postures. They claim they want to be left alone, but they are masters at setting up public occasions which are bound to draw attention, if not interference. Just as an unruly child will act up in a way that attracts adult intervention and then complain about it. Nearly every Sunday, there is some such event. Here, music is blaring forth from the open windows of an apartment on the corner of Haight and Ashbury, while in the street below, a crowd of hippies celebrates the sunny day. Traffic stops. The crowd grows. Finally, the police roll in with paddy wagons and nightsticks. The crowd parts, 
clearing the street. Everyone waits to see what will happen. Today, there is no violence, and there's a reason for this. The band called the Grateful Dead have announced they will make music in the park. Merry Christmas, folks. Merry Christmas. And the crowd moves along, provided with a place to go, something to do. The Grateful Dead are playing a tune called, appropriately enough, Dancing in the Street. Most of these people are young. Most of them come from middle-class homes. On the average, they are well-educated, or could be if they wanted to. But they do not want that, nor much else in our civilization, except on their own terms. In many ways, their terms have the glitter and the attraction of the bright and bold and noisy. But it appears to be style without content. They object to the ills which beset society, war, social hatreds, money grubbing, spiritual waste, but their remedy is to withdraw and do private satisfactions. When one thinks of the problems of our day which cry for attack and imagination and youthful energy, this seems like the greatest waste of all. The movement appears to be growing. Use of drugs appears to be spreading. There is the real danger that more and more young people may follow the call to turn on, tune in, drop out. Well, there are the hippies. They make you uncomfortable because there is obviously something wrong with the world they never made if it leads them to these grotesqueries. But granting the faults of society, you can say three things about them. They, at their best, are trying for a kind of group sainthood, and saints running in groups are likely to be ludicrous. They depend on hallucination for their philosophy. This is not a new idea, and it has never worked. And finally, they offer a spurious attraction to the young, a corruption of the idea of innocence. Nothing in the world is as appealing as real innocence, but it is, by definition, a quality of childhood. People who can grow beards and make love are supposed to move from innocence to wisdom. This is Harry Reasoner. The hippie temptation was produced under the supervision and control of CBS News.